welcome to our very first live tasting with Pinot Noir. I am so excited to be here with you guys today. I'm Amanda McCrossin and I am going to be taking you through a Pinot Noir tasting like you've never done before. So we're gonna be tasting through four Pinot Noirs in Napa Valley, three different AVAs, bringing in a, a few different vintners to help us along the way and starting off with Bouchain. Before we get into it, I wanted to uh, to talk about a few house housekeeping things. Um, at the bottom of your screen there, you'll see there's a little square with a question mark in it. That is your Q&A box. So if you guys have questions, put them there. I'll pick them up and uh, as we go through this live tasting, we'll bring up some live questions and ask our vintners and uh, we can keep it very uh, interactive. It should be very exciting. Um, after this is all said and done at five o'clock from five to seven you can head over to the facebook page facebook event page uh which is uh going to be linked here after and continue the conversation so you can talk in the comments there'll be more you can learn about with uh for pinot noir um so the conversation doesn't end at the end of this live stream so i'm gonna look for our friend bushain vineyards and see here they are we're gonna bring who's gonna talk about our very first pinot noir from napa valley from Bouchain Vineyards in Carneros. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Kajani. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm so excited. It's it's really nice to see you. I, I always forget when I do these live streams how nice it is to see a familiar face. So it's really wonderful that you're here with us. <laughs> of course. Where where are you right now? I'm uh, sitting in our winery, kind of hanging out. Nice. I'll show you a little view outside. Oh, Not I love that. It's sunny as yesterday, but still pretty. Oh, it's beautiful. Look at that fog hanging over, huh? Yeah. That's what Carneros is all about. That's right. Um, so, do you do you have the wine in front of you? Or are we tasting together? I do. I have. I have everything. I'm ready. Me too. It's Friday. It's Friday, and it's four o'clock and seven o'clock in the East Coast, and then somewhere in between. The rest of the United States, which is very exciting. So, um, we what are we drinking? We're drinking the uh, 2018. Uh, yep, this is 2018 Swan Clone Pinot Noir. Uh, we just released it, so it's a brand new release for us. But it's a it's a block, a vineyard block um, that was planted in '96. Mm. Uh, so we've been working with the wine or with the with the grapes for a long time and bottling this on its own for a long time. So it's fun to talk about it with with you guys. Yeah, I'm really excited. This is a wine that I am personally very familiar with, having served it uh, by the glass when I was a wine director. So I'm, I'm really excited to revisit this in the 2018 vintage. Thank you. Um, but before we get into vintage, I want to talk a little bit about the history of Bouchain um, and why it existed. I think, you know, people think of Napa Valley, and it hasn't always been this way, but, you know, they don't necessarily think Pinot first. Um, so talk about Bouchain a little bit and how it came to be. Well, um, this entire area in Carneros uh, was established as an AVA in 1983, but grapes were planted down here in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. um, so Judge George Stanley, don't say that three times fast, well, uh, planted grapes out at Stanley Ranch in the 1800s. Our property was planted in the 1800s, and this was like a happening spot. Uh, tons of agriculture, tons of uh, orchards, gold coming in from Northern California, and the ferry... Um, on Cuttings Wharf, which is out here, plus a railway on Buckley Station Road, which is where Bouchain is located, lots was happening. And it's obviously been replanted since then. But part of what moved Carneros into be calling, being called Carneros um, and establishing the AVA and planting Pinot Noir versus Cabernet down here is the proximity to the bay. So I don't know if you saw it as I was showing you um, the vineyards out back, but we're right on the water. You can see sailboat masts from where I'm sitting. Um, if you stand on our vineyard terraces, you're literally looking right across the bay to San Francisco. You can see the Salesforce Tower. You can see um, Mount Tamil Pius. Uh, so we're 35 miles as the crow flies from the city, and we have all that bay influence. The fog that you mentioned, uh, lots of like breezy, cool days. Um, I have to tell you a little story. My husband works up or was working up in St. Helena and I would call him, you know, random summer times and he'd be like, oh, it's 110. It's so hot. I'd be like, really? It's only 85 down here. And he'd just <laughs> hang up on me. So uh, it's much cooler this side of the valley with that fog and windy influence and really, really nice for thin skin grapes like Pinot or really beautiful um, high acid tangy Chardonnays. Both mm -hmm. do really well. How long have you been uh, been working with the Pinot Noir grape? 
Oh, my very first real winemaking job out of school was with Paul Meyer. And it's the year that they started making Pinot Noir from Wayfair Ranch. Mm. Um, so I started on what I'd like to call the dark side with Cabernet. Yes. And uh, once I tasted young Pinot Noir, it's so pretty and so lovely and really intoxicating. And um, young Cabernet, your mouth can sometimes feel like it's in a bar fight, much more <laughs> Also, <laughs> can someone write more... that down before we forget it <laughs> so I just I fell in love with Pinot Noir and I thought you know I was just in I was intoxicated so that that's where I went so I've been working with it since 2004 great yeah. and and I mean you mentioned the, the cooler breeze obviously but the temperature difference um soil wise anything particular in Carneros that lends itself to uh Pinot Noir or thinner skin grapes um, one nice thing is that we have quite a bit of clay soils here. So there's a lot mm. of loam on top of clay. You'll have, you know, three feet of soil, maybe four feet in some areas. And then you've got clay underneath, which holds water really well. Um, so instead of having to put really any water on the grapes, we basically dry farm. Um, we have this great water holding capacity, which is fantastic. I will say though, that, um, Different areas in Carneros are very much like different areas in Napa. We have a lot of volcanic rock out here, a lot of crazy um, pink and orange quartz. I should have brought my rock collection. I don't have it. <laughs> uh, but pink and orange quartz and, and really cool obsidian, um, much more volcanic than some other areas. Um, you know, just like the Napa Valley in general, there's so many different soil series and, and where you plant will, will change aroma and flavor slightly. I, will you, I mean, you segue perfectly because that was my next question. I mean, obviously, Carneros is sort of the flagship for Pinot Noir in Napa Valley, the place where I think most of the Pinot is coming from. Um, but I assume there's diversity within even that AVA um, yeah. on the Napa Valley side. And, and we are actually talking to two producers from Carneros for that reason. So um, as you think about some of the distinctions in, within Bouchine and the, some of the estate vineyards there, are there things that you think um, are, are more signature in the glass? Like, you know, do you think that a particular soil lends itself to what's in the glass um, when it comes to making the wines there? You know, it's hard because Pinot people just constantly talk about clone to the point of just being annoying about it, right? So you've got all these Pinot <laughs> clones which, ha which have really, you know, boring numbers, 828, 115, 777, 667, blah, blah, blah. And then you have all the heritage clones, which are named after people that basically brought cuttings from France in a suitcase or strapped on a leg into California Scandalous. back in the day. And those are named after people. And so you have Shalone, um, you have Mount Eden, you have Hansel, you have Calera, and then you have a bunch of these, but Swan clone being one that Joseph Swan brought in. But the point that I was trying to make is that a lot of times site will trump clone. And so whatever mm. you think triple seven tastes like, if you have it on different soils, that soil will lend itself um, will lend to flavor and aroma um, differences, perhaps being a little more tannic on one soil than another, or perhaps, you know, having a bit of a darker signature than it would on a different soil. So mm -hmm. I, I definitely have seen that. Do you think, um, I mean, this is Swan Clone here. Do you think, uh, what would you say are the defining characteristics of, of this particular wine and whether that comes from soil or, or from clone? You know, I, I, you can dive into that if you want, but I'm just curious about, about what you think this particular wine is all about? Um, we like to call the Swan Clone our ballerina clone. So, oh, I like that. Uh, as graceful and elegant as a ballerina is, nobody wants to get kicked by a ballerina, right? Incredibly <laughs> strong, muscular. So it's this, it's this great yin yang of 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 strength um, and real elegance and gracefulness. Um, Clones are funny, and, and the signature of Swan Clone tends to be that it's lighter in color, a um, little bit perhaps lighter in body and tannin, uh, but for being our lightest wine, it's also the last block we pick. Everything else is picked first, and this one just hangs out and waits. Um, and it's not that it's coming in high bricks at all, or high sugar at all. Um, it just kind of takes its time and, and yet remains really light and elegant. Um, so outside of my my ballerina characterization um just tends to be really fresh fruit so like a sour cherry cranberry uh, almost like a raspberry note sometimes mm -hmm. and what i like about it is there's there's a a really cool fresh green note we call it mm. snap, snap pea mm. um just something kind of fresh and green on it uh that that is just a really interesting layer and it normally has this hint of spice even uh the swan that's in super old neutral barrel 
um, will have like a, a little bit of a cinnamon, a little bit of a red hots kick at the very end. And so that sort of combination I find really fun. Yeah, I, I think um, some, there's a lot of people that are, one, very excited that we're talking about clones because uh, it's, I think it's a subject that we we know so little about as consumers. Um, and as a sommelier, I think it's one of those things that I, I wasn't really able to decipher between the different variables. Um, so the ballerina clone, I mean, the ballerina being swan, I think that's just like a, a thing that I can think through of all different swan clones that, that sort of resonates. There is a, a very uh, savory and sort of dark undertone to this wine. You know, as graceful and live and elegant as it is, there is something very dark and, and I think, you know, that, that snap pea, that green, that herbaceousness, um, mm -hmm. it's complementing the fruit really well. And I, I'm really excited to taste the hide a little later on because it is a completely different expression of Pinot Noir from a place that's really not that far away. And I think that's probably one of the most exciting things that we're gonna we're gonna be talking about today is the diversity within the region of Napa Valley when it comes to Pinot. No, oh, absolutely. And and Pinot Noir is so interesting. We have 88 acres planted and about half of that is to Pinot Noir. And we have the same Dijon clone on the same rootstock that's, I don't know, the equivalent of a football field away from each other, you know, 100 yards or so, completely different wines, completely different wines. And, and they're so close together, it makes no sense. But even, you know, year, I've been doing this, I've had five harvests here. So five years in a row, we go through all these wines blind and you taste these, these Pinot Noir clones. Of the vineyard and they're they have their own their own character their own signature it's really funny yeah i i have to uh go back to a comment just above the one that i'm seeing right now which is your nickname was debbie descriptor is that true oh did david say that i missed someone it. did i won't i won't <laughs> say who but someone yeah, someone yeah. commented i think that's one of my saintsbury guys uh, i was over at saintsbury for many saintsbury for many many years before i got here and they always tease me about my descriptions um but I don't know about you, Amanda, if I really love a wine, like I'll, I can write like half a page on it. I just want to, I don't know what it is. I just want to keep writing about it. So that was, uh, that was definitely a nickname. Yeah, I don't think anyone would ever call me at a loss for words. So I think we're probably in the same mode. <laughs> um, there, is, there is one question that I would love your take on. I know I, I have my take on it. Um, and I'm gonna, it's gonna pop up right now, which is, how long would you recommend laying down Carneros Pinot Noir? Sure. Um, so I don't have a, a huge library at Bouchain. Um, however, uh, when I was over at Saintsbury, I was there 2006 to 2015. Um, and we would go through and taste some of the older wines from like 94, 95, 96. There was a 96 Brown Ranch that was truly my favorite. So, and we were tasting those wines you know, up until the time I left, almost 20 years old, uh, they would be at the time, and they were phenomenal. So wines that are built with, um, you know, with beautiful acidity, with, with a bit of a tannin backbone um, from a phenomenal vintage, I mean, you can easily go 20 years. Uh, you know, a lot of times wines will be, will be, you know, fresh and intriguing and, and lively and beautiful for like that first, and this does depend on the wine, um, but maybe, you know, up until maybe seven, eight years, sometimes they'll close down just a little and you just kind of hold off on them for a second and then they flourish and just come back out. And you probably know way more about this than I do because you had all those killer aged wines at press. Yeah. But people we, will, will close for a moment and you have to just be patient. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think a lot of wines will, especially when it comes to aging, it, it, it doesn't, it's not a, a straight trajectory in any sort of direction. It, it is more of a, a bell curve or even uh, right. like a sine wave. Um, yeah. apologies for the, for the pup in the background, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I've had Pinot Noirs from Napa Valley back to the seventies and they're oh, totally. in, insane. Like we, you know, Spring Mountain used to be making Pinot Noirs and, um, gosh, there was a great one, uh, called the Trois Cuvée that they actually blended three vintages of, um, from the seven, late seventies or early eighties. And it was just oh, gorgeous. And we okay. love that wine, but you know, my, this maybe one of the saddest days of my life was when, uh, I found a magnum of, I think it was the first vintage of Bouchain Pinot Noir. And I went to pull the cork and it was so corked and it was saddest day of my life. But hey, I, was, I was hoping to have some experience with it. Well, we'll, we'll find some old wines, Amanda. Maybe, yeah. Well, I hate to cut you off, but this is the progressive Pinot tasting and we have oh, to keep good. this train going. So Go uh, with that, I will say Thanks, thank guys. you so much. No, and uh, I'll ask you to 
head on out of here and I'm going to bring in okay. Ancian and uh, Ken Bernards and we'll be going with him for the next 15 minutes. So let's Sounds keep it good. moving. This is my first time like going in and out like this. This is very exciting. So Hello. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. Thank you so much for being with us. Are you enjoying your Friday? Uh, finally, finally. It's been kind of a busy day. Did a little bottling this morning. Um, oh, good for you. That's always exciting for winemakers. Uh, one of our, well, generally our least favorite thing to do, but absolutely necessary. Yeah. How they, so which vintage were you bottling today? I was actually bottling uh, the first of our 2019s. Um, I bottled a little, a little Pinot Gris, so a relative of Pinot Noir. Oh, yeah. Well, I, uh, I'm really excited to, to be tasting this with you. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to be talking about the Coombsville Appalachian as it pertains to Pinot Noir, something that you have an enormous amount of experience with. And um, for those of you who are just joining us, this is the, the Ancien uh, Mink Vineyard Pinot Noir. This is Ken Bernard. He is the owner and the winemaker. So you've got double duty. You're a busy man. Um, so I want to talk about Coombsville and uh, specifically why you decided to choose that for uh, to make Pinot Noir because you really focus on Pinot. That is that is a something that you guys carry the flag for. Well, yeah, I mean my my um, my first Pinot Noir under the Ancien label we actually started in Carneros, so that was where the bulk of my my background, you know, my experience came from. But uh, along the way, when I was back in on the research side of things, I discovered a, uh, a really wonderful Pinot Noir made from a, a, an old vineyard in Coombsville. And although I, I didn't have access to that fruit, I, through serendipity, um, discovered that there was a grower nearby who would plant for me. In fact, to go a little deeper into the, into the story, um, we, we have only two and a half acres at the Mink Vineyard, and it was planted in... Actually, 1996, uh, the same year as Chris's wine. Uh, coincidentally, there's some swan selection there too. <laughs> uh, so Bill, Bill Mink uh, was, is now a retired orthopedic surgeon. He was practicing at that time. And uh, one of my favorite weekend uh, warrior things to do was to go out and play soccer. And I injured myself pretty good. And uh, ended up uh, you know, at the hospital talking to... Uh, Bill Mink's good friend, who was an orthopedic surgeon, and uh, he ultimately was checking my, out my, uh, my knee and then telling me, um, you know, I have a friend in Coombsville who's really interested in planting grapes, and he loves Pinot Noir. And I go, oh, really? Well, <laughs> so by the time I got on my crutches, uh, I was out meeting Bill Mink at, at his vineyard, and uh, within the next couple of months, the, the vineyard was actually being prepared to, to plant. And that's, so, that was the start of, of, of Ancien. Well, I guess the mink vineyard planting. The yeah. mink vineyard specifically. Yeah. Yeah. How fun is that? So, I mean, how would you, Linda says uh, Carneros and Coombsville are kiss and cousins. Sassy. Um, no, it's, how, it's amazing. It's amazing because they're separated literally just by the city of Napa. So my, my, my Carneros vineyard um, that where I focus is the Toyon farm, which is actually adjacent to the Hyde vineyard on the, on the Napa side just over the hill from the city of Napa, primarily marine sediments. And in contrast, you, you come over to Coombsville and it's all volcanic. Mm. So you have a volcanic, kind of a rocky alluvial um, over top of volcanic ash. And a picture is worth a thousand words. Or yes, minutes. please. Show and tell. That's the white volcanic ash. Um, is that the tufa? Is that what that's called? That's the tufa. Oh, cool. And it is really white. It looks like chalk. Yeah, uh, and it's super light, right? It's not heavy. It is. It has the porosity of, of limestone as well. It's not yeah. limestone, uh, but it, it kind of looks like it. Um, it's, a, it's a vineyard that we're actually practically able to dry farm because the water just kind of goes right into the porosity of the, of the stone. This is monolithic. It's at least, at least 40 feet down. We know that. Mm -hmm. And the vines kind of work their way down uh, through the little cracks and crevices um, at least 20 feet. Wow. So as far as um, making the wine, you make, uh, have made or make uh, wines from both Carneros and Coombsville. Is there any sort of distinction that you, uh, when it comes to either viticulture or uh, vinification processes between the two that, you know, are, are because of, of the different EVAs? I think our, I think our, Coombsville, um, our Coombsville site is some ways easier to farm than Carneros. Carneros, um, at least where, where I'm working with in Carneros, we have more clay soils. So 
they hold quite a bit of moisture early in the season and they get off to a pretty good start. And then you have to kind of titrate a little bit of irrigation through drip through the season as they run out of water or they'll, they'll overstress. And in Coombsville, it's a little bit more of a hands-off approach because the roots go down so deep um, they can kind of mine for nutrition and they just sort of, they, but they still have to work for it. They have to, it's not like it's overly giving. So the vines stay in balance, but then it's just kind of cruise through the season quite well. And how do you think that presents in glass? Is there any sort of defining characteristic that you would, that translates? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that the, both the fruit character and the tannic structure are, are markedly different. And to me, very recognizable. Um, there's a textural aspect about uh, Carneros Pinot Noir that's, that, that contrasts quite um, significantly with my, with my Mink Vineyard. Um, I get more what I would call blue fruit, um, pomegranate. Um, it goes the whole range from kind of blueberry pie to more of a fresh blueberry with an herbal component, which I get more of in the, in the 2018. So it kind of depends on the warmth of the season. Um, and then you get a striking kind of mouthwatering tannin character. Um, I call them Italian tannins, but mm. it also lends this sense of minerality in the wine. Um, that's something that is uh, somewhat apparent when the wine's released and just grows and grows as the wine ages in the bottle. Yeah, I think if, if there's one thing I can speak to, it, it's uh, between the, the two different wines, it's, it's types of fruit and texture. And for me, this is a lighter, brighter, not necessarily softer, it almost feels more taut. Um, it, it almost feels more vertical, whereas the Bouchin felt a little bit more horizontal. And I think, you know, just across the board, this is, is a huge generalization. I find more red fruited, that sort of like berry cherry, kind of like, you know, plushy, a little bit more easygoing in Carneros. And then in Coombsville, always a little, a little brighter, tighter, and like a little more wound up. And, you know, again, savory undertones kind of coming through both, but blue, purple, even like black fruit at times for this uh, Mink Vineyard 2018. I, I agree. I mean, one of the one of the things that really surprised me as I learned more about Coombsville and as this vineyard came in, we we actually put temperature recorders in the vineyards so we could see highs and lows all the way through the season. Um, and you know, Coombsville itself is a collapsed caldera, it's shaped like a bowl. So um, you, you know, literally um, surrounded by about 270 degrees of low lying hills, um, and then kind of a bench, which is where this is. Um, located this vineyard almost right smack in the middle of Coombsville. It gets a little bit of a side draft horizontal breeze that comes off of uh, the San Francisco Bay, so it, it uh, or San Pablo Bay. So it does have that moderation, but what is really, um, what really surprised me was how cold it would get at night. So my Carnero site, a little bit um, cooler maybe as a daytime high, but rather um, significantly warmer in terms of nighttime low. As far um, as it just sort of like remaining constant, like there's not as much of a diurnal, diurnal shift? Not quite as much because what happens in Coombsville once the breezes stop is the cold air basically settles down into that bowl and it's kind of trapped. So if you're at the bench, you know, the kind of flat area in the middle of Coombsville, um, you are you're basically have a, a, a blanket of cold air that settles down. It also is one of the coldest um, sites in Napa during frost season and we have spent a lot of money on running wind machines this year, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Um, well, there is a question that I would love for you to answer. And this is, uh, I think this is a, a question as tale as old as time, which is uh, st about stem inclusion. So it's gonna pop up right here. Is stem inclusion an important factor in your Pinot Noir program? And I would love for you to speak to, uh, to whether or not there's a difference between stem inclusion in, uh, in Coombsville versus Carneros, if at all. Um, Coombsville versus Carneros. I don't tend to use stems in Carneros. I love the, the texture of the tannins. Um, there's a fleshiness, and I, I agree with that statement about a horizontal character, almost a mouth coating character. Um, with, with Coombsville, I see really nice skin tannins as well. Um, and I don't use very much whole clusters. I use, I, I make some wines from out of the ABA or out of the out of the Napa Valley, in fact, where I use much higher percent of whole clusters. So I do use them. Mm -hmm. With Coombsville, I'm usually hanging out around three to five percent. So I'm basically just doing a little covering on the bottom of, the, of our one ton fermenters. And it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like just, you know, <laughs> a little bit of salt. Um, it just adds a little bit of a layer. Um, 
it, uh, it adds a little bit of a lift and it adds a layer of tannic structure. You can almost feel the tannins in the center of your tongue. Um, whereas the skin tannins are kind of around the outside of your tongue. It just fills out the wine. Um, but you can see that the wine already has really nice tension because of that bright acidity that it has. Mm -hmm. And the, to, to, to do like 30, 25, 30% whole cluster is going to crank up that. Um, it's going to pinch the wine a little bit more. And I, I feel like it's something that, that this wine doesn't need more of. So it really becomes very specific. I think even more to the soil type and the fruit characteristics in, this, in a given vineyard than to the season. I, I hear people talk about, you know, I use more whole cluster this year, you know, less another year. I will tend to use more, more whole cluster in warmer seasons because I think it adds, you know, again, it's some tension, um, some dimension and some brightness to wines if, if, it's, if we're on the warm side. And I will tend to use less on the cool side. But that said, I think the soil type itself is, mo is most important. Yeah. Uh, I, would, I would like to direct to the comments at this point and tell Gary Fish that he is welcome to drink at any time. In fact, should have been doing so, as Brett said, for the last 39 days. So um, are, you, are you drinking right now? Do you have a glass in front of you or are you abstaining since you just finished bottling? You know, I, I think the, the research is incomplete, but I, I have read where a glass of wine a day does keep the virus away. So I'm, I'm trying to at least do a glass a day. Um, Great. Yeah. So... So far, so good. <laughs> is, there, uh, is there one wine that you're making in particular that uh, you're loving the most right now? Um, you know, a lot of times we sort of like wrap our arms around the new releases because it's what's new, right? It's like, okay, you know, we've been two years in the making. Um, it's time to release the wine. How's it showing? And I, I find myself really... Um, kind of wanting to get to know them better. It's sort of like you, you followed them all the way through barrel. Um, you know, you're um, micromanaging everything. Uh, you have that tra traumatic day of getting it into the bottle, making sure everything goes perfectly, which was what this morning was all about. And then you just sort of ignore the wines for a while. You know, if they're in bottle, um, you're moving on to the next vintage, um, next season's coming. And so, you know, 2018 is gone to me. And then we start to release the 18s. It's like, oh, you know, what have you been up to? Have you been at <laughs> and so I'm actually, uh, I'm actually spending a lot of time with the 18s, with this wine specifically. Great. I, I mean, I, uh, I think this is drinking beautifully. And I have one, we have one minute. So I'll ask you one more question, um, which is, and feel free to not answer, but if you had to make a Pinot Noir from any other Napa Valley AVA, which one would you pick and why? Oh, that's um, that's a good uh, that's a good question. Um, I think it would be really fun. I'm not gonna I'm I'm gonna kind of dodge the question by throwing a couple of ideas out. But <laughs> I think there are these little nooks and crannies in Napa that are really appropriate for Pinot Noir. That they're not big enough to ever um, to plant significant acreage and ever become a thing, you know, um, on the national scene. But you know there are. There are cool high elevation sites, um, the very top of Spring Mountain, Howell Mountain, that would be really interesting. Um, so that would be kind of fun. And I, I don't necessarily always follow the, you know, the tribe except to the herd, except when, well, I want to and <laughs> good. Um, but I, I, I do enjoy kind of seeking out things um, from places that, that uh, are maybe not as, uh, as available as as well known and i think i think is a good example of that yeah i do too i i really love the pinots i mean i i think pinot is such an interesting grape um and we're so fortunate to have great representations of it in napa valley but uh you know coombsville just just clearly had something very unique about it there's an identifiable di identifiable characteristic that i find from most of the pinot pinot noirs from coombsville and i think this is a beautiful expression of it so thank you so much for uh for your work on this and for Fighting that good Pinot fight. We appreciate it. Thank you for the diversity you bring to Napa Valley. <laughs> well, with cheers to that. Oh, you do have a glass. You didn't put it up earlier. Well, cheers to that. Um, and uh, I hate to kick you off, but it's time. We got to keep it moving. Uh, so we're going to go to Antica next and talk to the winemaker, Marla. So uh, I'll say goodbye to you and uh, I'll bring her in next. So uh, let's keep moving. All right. Thanks so much. Bye.
My Carol, how are you? Hi, good. How are you? I'm so well. Thank you so much for being here. It's really nice to have you. And um, Great to be we've here. never we've never met in person, but I'm no. really excited that we're meeting virtually for the first yeah. time. <laughs> how very yeah. mo- millennial of us. I know so much. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got the Antica Antonori family estate Pinot Noir in front of me right now. Um, and though it says Napa Valley, this is actually all from the estate on Atlas Peak. Correct? Yes. Absolutely. Everything we do is 100% estate, 100% Atlas Peak. Yep. And is this your, was this your first foray into Pinot Noir? Or do you have, did you have a little experience? It was, it was my first foray. So I'm very new to Pinot Noir. Most of my experience in the past is with the Bordeaux varietals with, you know, Cabernet being the predominant one and Chardonnay. So I'm fairly new, especially compared to the other people on the, on the live <laughs> stream. <laughs> well, that's good. You bring a fresh yeah. shake. So, so, so they say that Pinot Noir is one of the most challenging uh, varieties to make. Did you find that that was the case? I've heard that it can be a very fickle grape to make. Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges in the winery is just how quickly it wants to ferment. So just managing the fermentation and trying to get the fermentation to go slowly enough that you can really extract out what you want to extract out before it just races through the fermentation was challenging, but I think we, it went really well in, in 17. So I think we got some really nice fruit. And I think the most important thing is we get true varietal character, um, which most people don't think of Atlas Peak as Pinot country. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, There's not, there are a few really, there's a few really good examples though. Um, This obviously being one of them. Um, you know, obviously, Antonori's got a, a, a history of making wine, which is very cool. Yes. Um, you guys make a, a, a wide range of things from Cabernet, Merlot, um, and Pinot Noir. So, you know, I think when, obviously, when we think of Napa Valley, we don't necessarily think of Pinot Noir immediately. Um, but mm-hmm. what was the impetus for wanting to pursue, pursue Pinot on this, on this property? Well, I think one of the impetus is that we have you know, because we're in the Foss Valley, we have quite the temperature fluctuation from the lowest elevation to the higher elevations in the valley. So we can get 10 to 15 degrees temperature differential from the from the bottom of the valley to the top. So the Pinot is actually at the lowest spot um, in our little Foss Valley, the hanging valley above Napa that we're in. So it's really quite cool there. It's actually the degree days for that site where the Pinot is are very similar to the degree days of Carneros. So, mm. um, so just having a really great spot for growing it. And also, you know, we have a wine club and we really want to give people a diversity of wines in their club. And we just feel like it's a great spot to grow Pinot. So it's an opportunity to do something different and to give our you know, the people who are buying our wine, something that's delicious and, and different, you know? Yeah. Well, as I said to Ken before, thank you for, for continuing to diversify Napa Valley and keep us, uh, keep us exciting and keep people coming back. I think, you know, if I, if there was one thing that uh, was really wonderful to talk with guests about, it, it was about the diversity of Napa Valley. And there was, and is a lot of, uh, of, of many different varieties that yeah. people can explore here. Yeah, um, for sure. Pinot being one of them. Was it planted on the property already or did, or did you guys plant it? As far as I know, we planted it. So it was planted in 2001. So. Okay. And to any particular clone? We have the three clones. We have 115, 777, and 667. So our blend is, is a good mix of all three clones. So we try to bring in each so that we get some of that clonal diversity in the, in the finished wine. We do a rosé from Pinot Noir as well. So that one also has the, has the three clones. We just try to bring in all three so we're getting that complexity. So, so we talked a little bit about whole cluster uh, with Ken. Is that something mm-hmm. that, that you employ as well or is that something that you sort of shy away from? We typically shy away from it. This year in 2019, we did a little experimentation with it. We did, you know, three different fermentations. Um, we got some new tanks this year, so we were eager to uh, to New try toys. yeah to try different <laughs> things with with the different pinots so the the last pick we tried a little of the stems but we t- we preferred actually the 100 percent distemmed and so that's what we've always done in the past that's what the 2017 vintage is all distemmed so we're probably going to continue in that vein but it's always good to try it and 
you know, try different things and to see what works. But typically, yeah, we like 100% de-stemmed. Excellent. Um, well, for those of you who are just joining us, we are drinking Antica Pinot Noir from, uh, it's not in Napa Valley, but it's from uh, Atlas Peak, and mm -hmm. we're with winemaker Marla Carroll. So if you guys have questions, there is that little square right next to where you can comment with the question mark in there. Feel free to hit that and send us your questions, and they'll pop up, and we can answer them. It's really exciting. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm smelling this. It is totally different from the two others that we've had thus far, which is mm -hmm. great, because this is that's the whole point of why we're doing this. Um, what are some of the identifiable characteristics that you find uh, with Atlas Peak Pinot Noir? I think um, it's the fruit is really vibrant. I mean, I think stylistically, we're really trying to focus on showcasing the varietal more so than anything else. So we are, it is, it is a bit naked in terms of using, it doesn't have any new oak, it's mm. once used oak. Um, and so I think you get a lot of cherry, berry, fruit aromas. There's always that great minerality that I think you get from Atlas Peak wines with the volcanic soils. Um, so yeah, I just think that it has a sort of a bright fruit character to it that I, that I get that's pretty distinctive. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's the, the bright fruit that I think we saw with some of the Coombsville uh, Pinot Noirs, but there's also a, a texture, there's tannin. Mm -hmm. um, and I, is that, are, are we at elevation at all? Is there, where is that coming from? So the Pinot Noir is planted at about 1400 feet of elevation. Oh, so yeah, that's, that's pretty significant. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas, you know, I think Carneros and Coombsville are pretty close to sea level. So yeah, it's a big difference in terms of elevation for sure. And, and where, um, I'm sorry, when are you harvesting? So this was harvested, two diff we had two different picks in 2017. I don't know if you'll recall, but there was kind of a heat spike right around Labor Day. Oh, I do. So it was hot. <laughs> it was hot. So we were trying to, you know, preserve some of the acidity and brightness in the Pinot Noir. So we did two picks, an earlier pick, which was August 31st, um, and then one two days later. And actually, even just two days later was a pretty dramatic difference in terms of mm. ripeness. So it was great because it gave us, um, you know, the early pick, which had not quite as ripe a fruit, but really good acidity. And then the later pick, which had a lot more berry cherry and a little bit more lush on the palate. Mm -hmm. So the final blend ended up being 70% from the second pick and 30% from the first pick. So, so yeah, you typically pick Pinot Noir in early September. Um, I think it was around September 5th this in 19, but that year was a tiny bit earlier just because of the heat. Yeah, it was very, very hot. Um, yeah. <laughs> can, you, can, can you say what degrees bricks you uh, you were harvesting at in 17 or just typically kind of where you're at? It, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't feel hot or anything like that. I'm just I'm curious because it, it does have such a great rich mouthfeel. Typically, it's 23 and a half, 24. It was a little bit higher in 17 because of the the heat that we got. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to pick up some questions here because they're, they're rolling in. Um, 14, I'll throw this up here because uh, you, you can answer this. 1,400 feet is above the fog? Question mark? Yes, yes yeah. it is. So we are yeah. above the fog layer. So um, we're in a cooler site, but yeah, we don't have sort of the the fog during the day, like the during the early morning hours, like the, the valley floor can have. So that's definitely a point of distinction. So um, this is fun. And then there's a really fun one after this. So uh, how does mountain AVA Pinot fruit such as Atlas Peak differ from Valley Floor Pinot? And I know you haven't messed around with any other Pinot, but hopefully you can speak to this a little bit. Yeah, so I mean, I think, um, I mean, the Valley Floor, I mean, honestly, you know, because of our volcanic soils, our pHs tend to be a little bit on the high side. So I would say like Carneros, Pinot, you might get a little bit more acidity than you're going to get in ours, but that doesn't mean that ours doesn't have good acidity or brightness. So I think it's, that might be partly why you're getting a lot more sort of lushness on ours mm. um, is because it, you know, it does have a lower pH value and that's kind of a product of our volcanic soils and also a product of our elevation. So I think that's one of the things. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think style I, plays a lot of into it too, you know. For sure. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's an, an important note as we're going through these is, is style really is a, is a very big uh, part of, of Pinot Noir and why it's different in different AVAs. And 
it's always mm -hmm. one of the hardest things to isolate those variables to figure out, you know, is it style or is it, is it soil and terroir? Right. So, um, right. uh, but I, you know, I get this, it's a, it's a, it's a, almost a tannin. It almost has like mm -hmm. those, uh, fine, like Nebbiolo tannins. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, it doesn't lead with acidity, but it's there, it's, it's there yeah. to balance it out. Mm -hmm. Um, and for me, this is like a, this is a great Pinot for someone that is enjoying, um, something like a steak or even something, mm -hmm. um, maybe like a pork, like a roasted pork loin. Um, I'm yeah. sorry if any of you have not had dinner yet and I'm making you hungry. <laughs> um, but for me, this is a meat lover's Pinot. This is a Pinot that like wants to stand up to something. Um, not because it's, you know, it's huge. It just has the tannin, I think, to to do yeah. it. Mm -hmm. um, there is a super fun question. Hopefully, uh, I don't, do you live in Napa Valley? I live in St. Helena, yeah. Oh, me mm -hmm. too. Great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so from California, wines, here it comes. Do you both have a Napa area takeout food recommendation to pair with this Pinot or favorite oh. cook? What did you say? Okay, or favorite cook. Okay, you first. Or I'll go if you don't have one. <laughs> oh, let's see. A favorite. I've been doing, we've been doing goths a lot because I have three kids. Mm -hmm. And so we have to do, do something that, that the kids enjoy. So um, I really like the Pinot you know, with a goths burger or even with their mm -hmm. their pokey tacos. They're one of my favorite takeout items, personally. The pokey tacos are so good. <laughs> they are really good. Um, I know Press see, well, I had a lot uh, of takeout too, but <laughs> yeah. I haven't gone there yet. So I need to do that. Yeah, I had, uh, well, this would be delicious with the chicken sandwich from, uh, fried chicken sandwich from press that you can get through the drive-thru. Mm, yes. Um, you may recall it was the steamed chicken sandwich that we did uh, for the Happy Meal um, back during uh, Premier Napa Valley. Oh, um, yeah. But I also had some really delicious pizza the other night from Grasswood. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a mushroom pizza. And I actually think this could work really well with that. Yeah. Yeah, we've been doing a lot of pizzas at home with the Trader Joe's pre-made <laughs> crust. <laughs> exactly. Um, somebody's asked, can you amplify Nebbiolo tannins? Um, I guess that's probably for me. Uh, yes, I can. You know, one of the things that I find when I'm blind tasting is um, the difference between Pinot Noir and Nebbiolo, I mean, are very many, but um, tannin is the most uh, significant difference. Um, and, and it is because uh, I find that they're uh, sort of sandy tannins that I get in Nebbiolo that I don't necessarily get in Pinot Noir. And sort of, for me, that's, that's what I'm talking about. There is these sort of like fine sandy tannins on here. Um, it is, Instagram telling me that I have one minute left of this, which means I'm gonna have to reset and start again. It's totally fine. Um, <laughs> but just so you guys know, I'll come right back. Usually we have an hour, so I don't know why they cut it down to 45 minutes. Um, but we'll come right back in one minute with Chris Hyde. Um, I would love to know, um, what grape you would love to make that you haven't, uh, haven't made yet in Napa Valley. Oh, that's a great, Ooh, that's a really good question. I love Syrah. And so we actually don't have any growing on the property right now, but I'd love to work with Syrah. So um, dream in the future. But um, yeah, so it's for me, that's what I'd love to work with, but I haven't Fantastic. yet worked with. So. All right. Well, we have uh, 10 seconds left. I'm going to end this. Don't go anywhere. I'm going to restart it again. And uh, we'll be back with Chris Hyde. So stay tuned. Thank you so much, Marla. We, we love you. talking. And there he is. Hi. Hi, Amanda. How's it going? I'm so happy to see you in the vineyard. Thanks for having me. Cheers. I'm, cheers to that. Well, I'm, I don't have it in my glass yet. I'm getting it right now. This is like a, a game of Tetris. If I, I hope someone will be able to take a picture of what's going on currently in my, in my like studio, which is really just me wedged between a dresser on this side and my bed on this side and then like two huge studio lights. So here we are. <laughs> Um, well, I'm, I'm really excited to be tasting this with you. I'm thrilled that you guys are, uh, are making this wine. I, I tasted this for the first time a little over a year ago and uh, didn't, didn't even know that Hyde was making their own wine because you guys are so famous for, um, for, uh, for growing the grapes and doing it so well. So can, yeah. you talk, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. So uh, Hyde Vineyards was uh, established back in 1979, first planting. Um, we've, we've been around for 40 years now, uh, mostly selling grapes to several different wineries in Napa and Sonoma. Um, and my father established the vineyards. Um, we, we sell grapes to about almost 40 different wineries now. 
Um, and we started making a little bit of our wine from um, this property here in Carneros back in 2009 under the Larry Hyde label. Um, cheers, this is the 2015. Cheers, this is beautiful. <laughs> I mean, really beautiful. So um, yeah, we, we've been growing Pinot probably since the 90s, early 90s. Um, we grow several different varieties here. Uh, the, the soils are very shallow here at our vineyards. I'd say um, at this particular site, 12 to 16 inches deep. Uh, mostly clay, heavy clay, which gives the vines um, a little more resistance. Uh, they struggle a little more and they're not over vigorous. Um, also, as mentioned earlier, we get a lot of cool weather influences here in Carneros. Mm. Um, we're at the tail end of the Napa Valley. So the, the sort of hillsides taper down to these rolling hills and we get a lot of coastal influence and cool weather coming in um, off of the coast through the Petaluma Gap. Uh, we're about 20 miles from the San Pablo Bay here. Um, so a lot of cooling influences um, and that's, that's great for maintaining natural acidity, which gives you these, these Pinot Noirs that have um, great expression um, and also density and, uh, and good acid, which, which gives you a wine that, that can also age very well. Yeah, I think, I think you just summed it up in a few words right there with, with density and good acid. This is, Carrie, uh, uh, Carrie, Carrie this is the vintage that I believe we did taste with Bridget uh, a few months ago. Um, yes. This is this is beautiful. I mean, Hyde Vineyard is is just so uh, is famous for a number of different reasons, but certainly those grapes have seen their seen their way into uh, some pretty incredible wines. When did you guys start making uh, your your own cuvee? So we debuted this um, small Pinot production back in two thousand nine. Um, we have some vineyards here. Uh, my dad established the original vineyards, like I said, back in the seventies. Um, my brother and I uh, helped my dad plant some new vineyards um, starting around 2000, um, which is where the whole uh, Larry Hyde um, program started, the, the uh, sort of expansion from Hyde Vineyards. We're now farming about 200 acres. Um, so we've been making this, this small production of Pinot for 10 years now. Um, it's, it's still just a few hundred cases and uh, mostly available here in California or from our new winery, which is where I'm sitting right now nice. here in Carneros. Um, so yeah, it, we've been doing it for about 10 years. Um, the winemaking, you know, it, everything starts in the vineyard. It's very simple. Um, harvesting the grapes at the right time is key. We have a, a mixture of uh, interesting selections that my dad and I kind of went around and gathered back in 2008. Everything's grafted by hand. Um, and we have about eight different selections in the vineyard um, that we co-ferment and we, we basically de-stem all the fruit and ferment it for about 10 days and then, um, and then it's pressed into barrel where the secondary fermentation happens and we normally do our racking and blending in April and after that we, we bottle in June so very very simple winemaking. Um, and um, the complexity comes from, from the vineyard and, uh, you know, the, the unique selection of clones and obviously the soil that we have here and, yeah, uh, it's, and the climate. It's enormously complex. I mean, it almost has a, a, a saltiness and a, we talked a little bit about savoriness, but the savoriness, I, I think we were maybe getting from the bouchine from the swan clone earlier. Um, this is more of like a, a mushroom um, and more of an, er, an earthiness Earthy. versus a savory. Yeah. Right. Um, and there's, I mean, there's massive amounts of fruit here. The, the density, I think what you said earlier is, is so spot on, but there is a, a lift and a balance to this wine. Um, you know, balance is most overused, overused words in the, in the wine vernacular, but um, truly, I think that's the first thing that comes to mind. It's, it's an impossible density with a lift um, that allows you to just kind of keep going back to it. Yeah, it takes you through all these things. And, you know, that's, that's the beauty of it. It makes you want to come back for a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we have a, a, a semi non wine related question that I'll, I guess we'll, we'll ask, which is, uh, they say it takes a lot of good beer to make great wine. What is your beer of choice to make such an amazing wine? The people need to know, Chris Hyde. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, <laughs> I, um, I've been an IPA drinker for a long time. Um, obviously, you know, I, uh, I like the Pliny's, 
Um, I'm, I'm into the very hoppy beers, um, a little less on, uh, on the malty side, but you know, um, that's a great question. I, I, I like to explore them all, but I'd say probably more on the IPA side. Okay. So the bitterness, you know, the, I'm, I'm into it. I can, I can tolerate it. I love it. I crave it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I'll invite anyone who's watching, uh, there's a little square with a question mark. Feel free to throw your questions in there and they'll pop right up. It's really fun. Um, everybody can see your question. Um, this, is, this is really brilliant. How, how vintage specific do you think this wine is compared to say the 14 or even the 16? Right, that's a great question. Um, each, each vintage is unique. Um, I'd say the 2015 um, has, has this, um, it's a very bold wine. It's, um, it's a tannic wine. It's, it's going to age for a very long time. Um, we had a little bit of shatter early in the season in 2015, which left us with, you know, hens and chicks, big and small berries. Um, can, and you just, can you just tell people what shatter means? Because I don't think everybody knows. Sure. Yeah, that's, that's when you have a, a weather event during bloom. So bloom is probably going to happen in a few weeks here in May. You'll see the clusters start to grow from their sort of primal stage. And then they open up and flower and you have these hundreds of flowers um, blooming around the same time within sort of a, a window of a week or two weeks, depending on how warm it is. And if you have rain or, or hailstorms during that uh, sort of delicate period, you can have injuries to these flowers that cause the, the berries to either not set at all or set very small berries um, or a mixture of large and small berries, depending on what day the rainstorm happened and how many flowers were out at that time. So that can leave you with um, a smaller crop or smaller clusters. It, it really depends on the severity of it. Um, so, you know, that, that leaves you with, uh, with um, a good variation of more acid berries and more ripe berries at the time of harvest. And uh, in some ways it's great for the complexity of the wine. Um, you can get a good amount of sugar and a good amount of acid at the same time. Mm. I so, remember the 14 being a little bit lighter. Yep, the 14 definitely had more acid. I'd say it was a cooler year, um, and it had a, a lot better set. So you had bigger clusters, um, a good amount of ripeness, and then at harvest time, it sort of cooled off, and you had plenty of time to contemplate when to, when to pull the trigger on harvest. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, Carneros is a bit of an outlier as far as uh, the, the generalizations of a vintage when it comes to Napa Valley. And 15 for me was always, I called it the golden retriever vintage because it was just like, just so opulent and like friendly. And it was just a wine that wanted to be friends with everybody, um, which I think is is very much this wine. Um, so I, I, that's why I ask if there is, you know, a little bit of differentiation. Right. And um, small quantities too. Small, yeah. Yeah. Um, Wow, you have a lot of questions. Uh, well, we'll start with my, my always a favorite question of mine, which is, what is the average aging period? Okay, so, you know, average aging period for, uh, for our Pinots, I'd, I'm just going to throw out between 12 and 20 years. It really depends. It really depends on, um, on the vintage. So for this wine, I, I think this 2015 can go beyond 20 years of aging. Um, like I said, we've been making a wine for 10 years, so we haven't really... Um, we haven't really hit that point where, where we know for certain um, some wines are going to age a little better than others. Mm. Um, this is a nice one. Uh, is the Pinot on the dark fruit or bright fruit spectrum? That, that's I, know, good... I know where I stand. <laughs> well, it, it has a little bit of that bright fruit. Um, I'd say that we have components that go into the blend that represent both sides of that. Um, our Calera clone has more of the, the dark fruit and the plum um, and then we have another clone that's uh, origins are from Oregon. Uh, that's a little bit more of the strawberry light fruit um, flavors. So you have a little bit of both of that. You definitely have some some brightness and um, and freshness. And I think that's characteristic of our Pinot. Yeah, I think I'm in the both camp too. I don't I don't think. Uh, sorry, I didn't turn this question off. I don't. Uh... I don't get one over the other. I get them sort of in harmony or or in tandem. Um, There's a little bit of both. Yeah. A little bit of both. I like it. Um, I'm loving all the comments going on between Gary and the rest of the world. Um, <laughs> uh, I think this is how many producers, uh, how many producers make wine from the Hyde Vineyard? Right. So like I said, it's, it's close to 40 different producers. 
Um, I'd say we have about a dozen vineyard designated producers. And then um, a little more, about 60% of the grapes I grow go into larger programs. I sell a lot of Merlot to Duckhorn, for example, and mm. Chardonnay to, to larger producers like Farniente. And, um, and um, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's a little bit of both. Um, but yeah, quite a few different producers, a lot of personalities. Um, it's a very interesting job growing grapes for, for all these different winemakers and, um, and for dealing with <clears throat> all these great personalities. Um, but, uh, but I enjoy it. Uh, we, we learn a lot. We get to go and taste with all sorts of different, you know, folks and, and see different winemaking styles. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, you guys all seem to be friends. I mean, I think like, even just looking at uh, this, this common, uh, all the comments on this feed, I mean, it seems like everybody kind of knows each other and is friends with each other down there. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a great, <laughs> it's a great industry to be in. It's a great community to be a part of, you know, we, we, we love it. We all get along really well. And even through hard times like this, it's, um, it's, it's, it's things like that to bring us all together. Yeah. The good times and bad. Um, if there were one grape that you could grow on your vineyard that you don't currently, what would it be? Oh, that's a good question. Mm, we, um, we grow several. Um, what would I want to grow that I don't already? Gosh, you know, um, <laughs> I haven't pondered that too hard. Let me think. Uh, we haven't, we've never tried, you know, um, I'm struggling with that one a little bit. <laughs> That's all right. I mean, I think I think that is a, a an important thing to note about Hyde Vineyard is that it's a, it's not just Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. I think we all think of Hyde, we think of that, but there there are many varieties that are done incredibly well that go into some beautiful wines, um, both both yours and otherwise. Uh, so maybe I'll I'll give you one other question. I don't know if it's easier or not, um, but what if you had to sum up Carneros as an ABA for Pinot specifically? Um, give me three to five words that you think would, would surmise. Before I answer that, I'll try to answer the uh, variety question. I think okay. maybe Malbec would be interesting. Malbec. Oh, fun. You don't make that up? No, we don't. And, oh, uh, and that's probably something that, that could work out here. Okay. Yeah. So, so you want me to sum up Hyde Vineyards? The question Hyde Vineyards. Well, I think Car Carneros has an ABA. Carneros has an ABA. And, and maybe that's just, maybe that's too broad, but feel free to just answer if you think it's Hyde. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see here. Um, you know, um, we are we are definitely the gateway into the Napa Valley, I'd say. That's that's mm -hmm. one good way to put it. Um, we, it's it's easy access to everywhere. We, we have, um, you know, a great flow of, of not just, people flowing through here. Um, it's an, it's an open region and we're, we're close to all sorts of different hubs in the world. Um, the weather patterns flow through here, the, the amount of birds that we have going through, um, migration. Um, yeah, something like that, I guess. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> great. That's great. I, you know, I don't, I didn't think uh, you would give me some like cheesy lingo. It was, that was actually really spot on. Thank you. Right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> your your farmers and vineyardists first and foremost. So I appreciate the migration note. Right. Um, well, good. Well, we've we've hit our time. It is five oh one, and uh, so I'm gonna say goodbye to you. But thank you so much for sharing this with me and with everybody else. Thank you for sharing your knowledge, and uh, I think this was this was very informative for me. Hopefully, it was informative for you guys. But thank you for for participating. Um, it doesn't end here. If you guys would like to uh, continue the discussion or learn more about Napa Valley Pinot Noir, you can do so by heading to the Facebook event page and the conversation continues in the comments there. So uh, I'll put up a little Instagram story after this with a swipe up so you can just head right on over. And um, guys, thank you so much. All of the Pinots um, were amazing today. They're all so distinct. And I think we've proven that, that Pinot Noir Napa Valley is a thing and it's a great thing. And uh, I look forward to drinking more. So thank you, Chris. Thanks, thank Amanda. you to all of you guys. And thanks for the Napa, to the Napa Vendors for hosting me today. I appreciate it. Cheers. Bye guys.